All right, welcome to another lecture on blood gas. So this one's going to get some into the interpretation. So we'll get a little bit deeper than we did in pulmonary EMP. So the first ones we'll talk about is the reasons for doing a blood gas. Well, we talked about this in the last PowerPoint to determine oxygen level of the patient's body, to look at how they're breathing, and then to see if there's acid-base balance disorder. So remember, in the NBRC hospital and in real life too, this is where they cross over pretty well. Uh, if a patient's not breathing and their oxygen's low, fix the not breathing part. Because if you give them oxygen and they're still not breathing, that means CO2 is not getting out of their system. CO2 is parked on their hemoglobin. It's parked in their plasma. And we cannot get oxygen to the tissues like the heart or the brain unless we get rid of the CO2, which ventilation is what gets rid of CO2. So that's why we need to make sure when we're looking at these patients, ventilation is actually more important if it is an issue it needs to be taken care of. When you take care of ventilation, oxygenation will correct. But if the patient's breathing adequately, then we can mess with FiO2 and how much pressure we're pushing into the alveoli. But until the patient has adequate gas exchange, like just fixing oxygenation alone won't do it. So when you're faced with this decision down the road, if a patient's not breathing well and their CO2 is high and their oxygen levels are low, do something about the rate and the depth of their breathing, uh, whether they meet parameters for intubation, so on and so forth, but fix ventilation first, right? You walk into the room, if someone's not breathing, you do something about them not breathing. That's why their oxygen levels are low, because they can't get rid of that CO2. That's a big, big thing. So ventilation is a higher life function, and when you take care of ventilation, usually oxygenation will follow. Uh, we'll get into some things down the road in advanced classes, but this is the big one to pay attention to now. And if you only master that one thing, you walk into someone's room and they're not ventilating and you know to assist their ventilation, then you're light years ahead of a lot of people that are out there. So just remember, ventilation is going to be a big thing here. And so blood gas is going to be your big proof that the patient is either ventilating fine or they're not ventilating fine, right? Arterial versus venous. So when we're looking at arterial uh, and venous values, um, we're going to look at things that will help us determine where issues are. And so we sort of did this in pulmonary AMP as well. Arterial PaO2 uh, is something that we can look at for oxygenation to the diffusion into the uh, plasma as well as arterial saturation, which looks at how well oxygen parks onto that hemoglobin molecule. Um, so when we're going to look at this, uh, we can look at arterial um, values to really see what's going on with the lungs. Are the lungs effective at what they're doing? If you just get venous values, if you just get a venous draw, a venous blood gas, off of a central line. Now remember, VVGs have to be off of a central line. They can't be off of a peripheral IV. They have to be off of a central line. So if you just did a central venous blood gas off of a central line, you would get values that tell you, hey, their pH is low, or hey, their CO2s are high, right? You're gonna get those values, but you're not gonna know how effective the lungs were because those values are downstream of also the metabolic processes. So you don't know if they just have a hypermetabolic process, but their lungs are working fine. So you're going to be more accurate if you get an arterial blood gas versus a venous blood gas, unless you're looking at something specific like sepsis. Now in sepsis patients, we do get venous blood gas draws from the central line to look at venous oxygenation and venous saturation to see how bad their metabolic process is. Because it's such a high metabolic process, we want to see how severe their metabolic rate is or how high their metabolic rate is, I should say, how bad their infection is, and we can actually trend it. So. Venous values, usually as far as oxygen and pH and all those things, 
will vary depending on the metabolic process. As long as the metabolic process is constant and at a normal level, then VEBGs and ABGs can be correlate well. But remember, that's a variable, that's a factor. So in order to avoid all the confusion of, well, they could have a metabolic issue, then go ahead and get an arterial blood gas. Now in the pediatric world, as far as the pediatric ICU, if this kid has a central line and they don't have an arterial line, we're going to get a central, right? We're going to get a VBG and look at where their pH is. Unless we know that there's a metabolic process, then we might have to get an ABG. So these are things that we'll have to look at. Um, so there's not great correlation between arterial and venous if there is a metabolic process. So we sort of got to understand the differences between the two, when it would be good to get one versus another. Um, so things like this uh, that can show mixed acid or um, a high metabolic process really would not be the time to get a VBG to consider how well the lungs are working. You can get it to trend how well the metabolic process is going, but it would not be something that you should use to make ventilator adjustments based upon. I hope that makes sense. Uh, venous CVP blood, central venous pressure blood, is still uh, incomplete matching because it's not quite close to the heart yet. Um, Swan GANS is going to be your most accurate place. Remember, this is that, that balloon tip flow directed catheter, corn dead BRC hospital, that sits uh, where the, the distal tip of that catheter sits right in your pulmonary artery. And so, in theory, you can draw from that and get blood and that's true mixed blood that's right before its lungs because it's from the pulmonary artery so it's right before the lungs so that's where the blood is at its most mixed and le is less influenced by just the closer processes so you're going to if you do get a VBG get it as close to the pulmonary arteries you can now in most patients out there unless you work in a cardiac ICU the CVP is going to be your closest place if you are working in cardiac ICU or in an OR or in IR or in cath lab, you might have a swan GANS uh, in that patient. That's when you might draw that distal tip of the swan GANS catheter. But other than that, CVP might be the closest you get. So you're just going to have to use that one. Interpretation, uh, decreased mixed venous blood. Uh, this means the lungs have not oxygenated the arterial blood well. Um, so your PVO2, your SVO2, or your content uh, could all be low. So when we're looking at mixed blood, um, that means that blood could either be bad from a high metabolic process it could be that we didn't get enough to begin with, like that picture that I used to draw in pulmonary AMP. And you, I know you guys all love the picture of the lungs and the tissue. And where was the problem? Where was the car accident, right? With the CCO2, the CAO2, and CVO2, right? So that's sort of what, what we're looking at here. So when we're looking at mixed venous blood values being decreased, it could have been the lungs, that's the first bullet point here, or it could have been the heart. Uh, it's not circulating the blood well. And usually you'll know it's the heart pretty easily because either an echo and or their blood pressure is very, very poor. So they'll have an echocardiogram or their blood pressure uh, is also very, very low. It's usually a sign they're not pumping the blood very well if their blood pressure is low. If our arterial oxygen is normal, in other words, we draw an ABG and we get a VBG, the lungs are doing their job. Uh, now we either blame the heart or circulation, uh, and this could also be a metabolic process too, but the heart or circulation could be the key here. So this is when, if we haven't gotten an echo and their blood pressure is trending lower, maybe we get uh, get someone to look at their blood pressure. Maybe you look at their um, cardiac motility, see if they do have an enlarged heart. Um, so this is where we have the blood sort of just staying, staying stagnant in their tissues. And this means that there's more metabolism going on because the blood's not pumping well through the tissues it stays stagnant and more oxygen gets drained from it so even if you didn't have a temperature right if the patient wasn't in a high metabolic rate just that stagnant blood alone can cause a big gradient between your 
uh, CC or sorry CaO2 and your CvO2. So that's a big gradient because the they're vasodilator because their blood's not pumping appropriately. So the arterial oxygen is normal. The lungs are doing their job. So this means should you be increasing uh, a rate and a tidal volume in all these settings on a ventilator because their lungs are doing their job? No, right? Because you can actually cause damage if you do too much of the positive pressure ventilation. So this is where we run into issues there where people might try to correct these issues based upon a venous blood gas when in fact they're actually causing harm. So these are things that we need to look at. That's why we need the ABG to know that we're not going to destroy the lungs with making these parameter changes. So that's why ABGs will still be a staple out there until there's something that hasn't been quite invented yet that comes out. But that's one of the big things. Is the blood staying stagnant in the tissues, right? So if it's not passing through the tissues fast enough, it has a higher me me metabolic rate, uh, not because the tissues are having an infection, but because the blood's just moving slowly through there and more oxygen's getting pulled off and more CO2's getting pulled on. There are three ways to measure oxygen in the blood. Your content of arterial oxygen, which of course you all remember this. You look at how much is in your plasma, which is your uh, PaO2 times 0 0.003, and expect to do these equations soon. And then you look at how much is on your hemoglobin molecule, which is your hemoglobin times 1.34, times your saturation. Remember, your saturation always is in the form of a decimal. So if your saturation is 97%, you're going to multiply it by 0.97, right? You're not going to do it times 97, times 0.97, right? Then we're going to add those two together, and that looks at your content of arterial oxygen. So PO2 is how much is dissolved in the plasma. SAO2 is how much parking spaces you have or content or capacity you have on your hemoglobin molecule to carry oxygen. Remember, most of the carrying is done on the parking spaces, right? That's your parking garage. The PO2 is just what starts the cascade into the parking garage and off of the parking garage. So um, remember, oxygen is carried, dissolved, and combined. Dissolved and combined are these two blanks here. Dissolved and combined. So remember, you always use that decimal point there, and it's carried, dissolved, and combined. The bulk of it's done on the hemoglobin molecule, and then the rest of it's done on the in the plasma, dissolved in the plasma. But remember that PO2 has got to be at a decent level, otherwise that cascade does not. That's a big key. Left shift versus right shift. Left shift means you love oxygen. That hemoglobin molecule will not get rid of it. So you have good saturation because it won't get rid of it. But your PO2 is low. So once remember when I said that, you need a PO2 that's high enough that causes that start of the cascade to get off of the hemoglobin molecule and into the tissues. So with a left shift, you have a high saturation and a low PO2, a low, low PO2. So things that will cause or can cause this. If someone's in a severe alkalosis, someone's hyperventilating, they've seen a ghost, all right? That's one of those things that you'll have to look at, right? Hyperventilating, they can easily go into a left shift where their PO2 is low because now their PO2, they've gotten rid of so much CO2 that the PO2 then pushed oxygen onto the hemoglobin molecule, which means since the oxygen moved from inside the plasma, to on the hemoglobin molecule, that means that the PaO2 is now low because that oxygen decided, hey, there's plenty of parking spaces. Instead of parking on the street, you know, plasma, I'm going to park in the parking garage, the hemoglobin molecule. So it parks in the parking garage, and now there's less oxygen in the plasma, all right? And so when we're looking at this, now we don't have enough to start a cascade into the tissues. So that can cause a left shift, right? Increased pH, decreased CO2, hypo, 
hypothermia, so decreased temperature, decreased metabolic rate. That's the 2 to 3 D, uh, DPG or BPG. It's a product of glycolysis. Uh, decreased P50, so that means at a saturation of 50%, your pressure of oxygen will be less than 27 millimeters of mercury, right? So this is something we all went over in pulmonary MP, which I know you all remember with fond memories. Um, so that means that P at the 50% saturation, the P50, at 50% saturation, the pressure it takes to get at 50% saturation will be less than 27. So if I said their P50 was 12, you would say they're left shifted because that's less than 27. There it means the hemoglobin molecule is going to have more uh, affinity to carry oxygen. And so there's going to be less oxygen actually available to the tissues because of the cascade starter, which is the PaO2, not the SaO2. That PaO2 is now gone. Instead of being in the plasma, it's now parked on a hemoglobin. And so that's why it cannot get off into the tissues. So even though PO2 transports very little oxygen, it is very important. It is small but mighty. A right shift, uh, acidosis, these are all things that increase carbonation or, or metabolic rate. Uh, anything that will cause that uh, acidosis, anything that's an increase in, in anything, uh, you're looking at this. So an increase in hydrogen ions, right, even though it's a decreased pH, right, if it's an increase in hydrogen ions, we know that that's Heavens to Betsy, if I can draw a hydrogen ions. That's why I'm not an artist. All right, so hydrogen ions, uh, decreased pH and acidosis, uh, increased CO2, increased temp, increased DPG, BPG. Remember, that's a product of glycolysis, which is metabolism. Increased P50, this means that the, the pressure it takes, so the PO2 it takes, to get to a saturation of 50 will be increased. So that means this number will be above... 27. So if I say, hey, their P50 is 53, or their P50 is 112, that would mean that they're right shifted because it's greater than 27. And if I said their P50 was 28, you would say they're right shifted because it's greater than 27. And of course, we're talking about humans here. But um, so the PO2 it takes to get to 50% saturation, they would need a higher amount of pressure to get there. So with this one, remember, with the left shift, right, with the left shift, they're going to have high saturations and low pressures. Well, that means for a right shift, it's going to be the opposite. They'll have high pressures, but low saturations. So that's going to be the big difference here. If I told you someone had a PaO2 of 85, but their saturations were in the 60s, then you would say they were right shifted because that pressure is so high and their saturation is so low. Hey, what caused their shift to the right? Well, this means nothing unless you know what to do about it. So what caused the shift? Well, we need to look at what caused it. Oh, what's on their blood gas? Their blood gas shows a pH of 6.9. Okay, that will do it. That will cause a right shift. Let's work on correcting that pH, right? So that's where this all gets to. It, therapeutically, for the NBRC hospital, they say the treatment for all of these is to give them oxygen initially. <laughs> They're left shifted or right shifted. Give them oxygen, but we need to ultimately figure out what caused them to shift. Because they're going to have a poor time getting oxygen to their tissues if they're left shifted. Poor time getting oxygen to the tissues if they're right shifted. So therapeutically, initially, you're going to give them oxygen. It's going to help until you figure out what's wrong with them. So this is what you're looking at, the left shift, right shift of the curve. We've all gone over this before. If it's increased, it's a right shift. If it's decreased, it's a left shift. The affinity is the only thing here. Uh, left shift loves, so that's where the affinity part comes in. It loves its oxygen. Right shift refuses oxygen. The hemoglobin will refuse oxygen. Right? Left shift, the hemoglobin loves its oxygen. So. It's going to be the big thing to remember here. High metabolic rate versus low metabolic rate. Now remember, this normally happens when you go to your tissues. If I go to my leg muscle here, and I go into the lungs here, and I'm not even going to try to draw lungs here. But if I go to the lungs, 
I'm left shifted, right? That's on purpose. That's where I can pick up a lot of oxygen and carry a lot of oxygen. I want to be left shifted in my lungs. I have a low, uh, higher pH here because I've gotten rid of CO2. I have a lower temperature because I've gotten rid of uh, a temperature release here. I have less met metabolic rate because my lungs aren't a high metabolic organ. Right, And then when I get to the tissues, high metabolic organs, lower pH, so on and so forth. And I want to get rid of this oxygen that I picked up here. So at my tissues, when I go from left shift in my lungs, and now I make it to my leg muscles, I'll be right shifted at my tissues, which is perfect. Because that means I'm going to dump the oxygen off to the tissues and I'm going to be able to carry more of the CO2. So this is a perfect relationship. This is a normal healthy relationship. You just don't want that going off. Uh, always relay oxygen content uh, to FiO2 when we're looking at this. So um, and a saturation of 97% with the PO2 of 100 millimeters of mercury is normal on room air. But when we're looking at where patients wearing oxygen, especially a lot of oxygen, like let's say 40%, that's not normal because normally you're wearing half of that, right? You're usually wearing 21%, which is room air. So now you double that 40%. Uh, now you're using a lot more oxygen to get to the same levels as someone that normally doesn't wear it. So that's not normal. So if someone has these values and they're on 40%, that's not normal, right? That's something going on there. So we need to figure out what their oxygen requirements. So in Colorado, especially if you plan to practice here at another high altitude state, uh, the pressure of inhaled oxygen is something to consider. Um, the PiO2, pressure of inhaled oxygen, decreases with barometric pressure. So as you climb a mountain, you're going to have a lot less barometric pressure. Well, barometric pressure is what pushes, as far as Dalton's law, that's part of the thing that helps push the diffusion of oxygen across the alveolar capillary membrane. So the higher in altitude you go, the less pressure there is to push oxygen across into the bloodstream and cross into in through the alveolar capillary membrane into the bloodstream. So the higher you climb, the less pressure there is and therefore the less likely you are to diffuse oxygen, right? That's something to look at. So this is why we have hyperbaric chambers, right? Where we dive patients, which means the barometric pressure increases. Therefore, we have the total pressure exerted on the lungs. It was increased of oxygen, therefore better diffusion, right? So that's something that we'll be looking at here. So something that we would take into consideration, especially people that visit from out of state. Um, that's what we're looking at. So the concentration of oxygen is not different. The air is not more rare in Colorado. That's a common misnomer. Uh, people love to repeat that all the time. It is not air. It is still roughly 79% and 21%, right? It's still roughly that same concentration. Your just ability to diffuse or get it into your bloodstream is subsequently decreased because of less barometric pressure. However, you try to say that to television people, see what happens. All right, interpretations. So let's start with causes of hypoxemia. So there are pulmonary causes. So this is where we get to blame the lungs, right? Remember the whole blame game? This is where we're going at it here. Alveolar hyper, hypoventilation. Uh, this could easily be someone with a, a neuro injury. Um, so we can think of someone that completely stopped breathing. Uh, this could easily be someone, like I used to use the example of a drug overdose, or it knocked out their drive to breathe, right? Um, or it could be someone with a, a spinal cord injury or a neuro injury where they just simply do not have the drive to breathe. Or let's say it's SMA um, or it's uh, ALS where it's a neuromuscular condition that eventually their muscles aren't allowing them to breathe at a normal CO2. So that would be a cause of alveolar hypoventilation. 
diffusion defects. Easily, this is a classic one with interstitial lung disease like pulmonary fibrosis, where the tissue gets really, the alveolar capillary membrane gets really, really thick and causes that inability to diffuse across that membrane. Uh, of course, a right to left shunt could easily cause this. So right side, it'd be your venous side. Your left side would be your oxygenation side. So if you had a hole uh, that, or, or a tumor or anything like that that would actually cause a right to left shunt, then that could easily cause hypoxemia. And most of the patients that I did my um, shunt studies on where I had to calculate, draw a VBG and an ABG, and do the actual shunt equation. Uh, yes, I was asked to actually do those things. Most of them ended up having a right to left shunt and they were trying to figure out how severe it was and whether or not to treat it. And so that's what I was looking at here. So don't discount this right to left shunt. That can happen, especially with cardiac issues. And one of my patients that I remember most vividly, he had uh, core pulmonale, which means right side of heart failure, and he had a patent for aminal valve, which is the opening between the two atria. Um, so he had a higher pressure on the right side of his atria than on the left side, so it became a right to left shunt. And so he was pushing bad blood into the good side, and so that's one of the things we had to look at. However, if we would have closed it, um, he would have gone into left ventricular failure as well so it would have been an issue altogether so this is something that you'll be looking at so uh, and then obviously vq mismatch we had a whole lecture on this i love the vq mismatch lecture hopefully you guys took good notes from that one if not we can always go over it later which i know you'll take me up on for sure uh, looking at alveolar hypoventilation this is what we were just talking about something that decreases their tidal volume something that decreases their rate or something that decreases both. So tidal volume, remember, is how deep or shallow you breathe. So if I have interstitial lung disease, can I expand my tissue very well? No, because remember my respiratory zone is becoming a giant piece of scar tissue. So my tidal volume cannot be as big as a normal tidal volume because I'm turning the respiratory zone into scar tissue. So that would decrease their tidal volume. So that would cause it. What if I decrease the respiratory rate, like like what I said with a neuro patient or someone with um, a spinal cord injury that could not uh, breathe at a normal rate, their brain's not firing at a normal rate. Uh, and sometimes that can cause both a decreased tidal volume and a decreased respiratory rate. So that would easily cause it. So when we're looking at this, remember we usually look at it, we use the term minute ventilation a lot, so that's your rate times your tidal volume. So if there's a decrease in their minute ventilation, that means they're going to retain more carbon dioxide. So an increase in CO2 means the parking spaces are taken up, and subsequently their PaO2 is decreased, right? Their A to A gradient, should still be normal, but you're still having a hard time getting oxygen to go into, or sorry, into and on your hemoglobin molecule. So you can still get it in there, right? There's nothing stopping from getting oxygen into your bloodstream here. You're just not having the ability for it to park on the hemoglobin molecule where it needs to go. So it'll stay in the alveoli. It will get into the plasma. It just cannot park where it's supposed to park. The parking spaces. Um, diffusion defects, we just talked about this one. Anything that causes the AC membrane to be a little bit thick. Uh, classic one here is what I just proposed was an interstitial lung disease of any kind. And there's over 200 different types of ILDs out there. Um, good pasture syndrome runs to mind. Uh, there's the pneumoconiosis, the ones, ones that were caused by like asbestosis, silicate, so on and so forth. And we'll get into some of that in disease class, but anything that thickens the AC membrane could easily do that. Uh, reduction in surface area, uh, the classic one I think of here, is a pneumonectomy, right, for someone with severe pneumonia, or not severe pneumonia, <laughs> severe emphysema and or the, a lung cancer, a, a, a non-small cell tumor. They were able to um, 
remove with a lobectomy, right? Reduction of surface area could also be from stage four emphysema, right? Because they destroy a lot of that alveoli. Remember those slides of lungs that I would show you guys, uh, where you sort of seen the Swiss cheese look of the apices, and so that in emphysema patient, hypoxemia is usually pretty mild in this case. Uh, usually, just a little bit of FiO2 can easily fix this, right? So this is why you see people with uh, the mid to late stages of emphysema wearing just a little bit of oxygen, right? That's all you're looking at here. Um, so their A to A gradient is increased. In other words, it's harder to get from in the alveoli, which is the big A, into the artery. So it's harder to get from A to A. It's harder to get from inside the alveoli to inside the blood. So there's something blocking slowing it down. Right to left shunt, uh, this is where we're going past either non-ventilated alveoli. So this is a non-congenital defect, right? So this is something where if we just hypoventilate for a while, right? We lay in bed for two weeks solid, right? This is something that could easily cause this. Atelectasis is a shunt-like effect because we have blood flowing through the lung tissue that's closed and not picking up oxygen and retaining its venous stature <laughs> and now it's in the uh, in the lungs uh, and through the lungs without picking up oxygen and getting rid of co2 so that means it's a right to left shunt uh, so therefore your 8a gradient will be increased of course uh, these are patients that do not respond well to oxygen you can increase it and increase it usually they're not going to have a drastic change in their saturation with oxygen administration. VQ mismatch, there's a lot of stuff that can go on here. This is the most common cause of hypoxemia. This is the classic thing, and I don't recommend you do it, or if a doctor ever asks you what uh, caused their hypoxemia, you could say VQ mismatch, and you wouldn't be wrong, but you wouldn't be really helping out anything on the situation. So with the VQ mismatch, um, most common cause of hypoxemia, a low VQ mismatch would be a shunt. So this was very common with pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and atelectasis. Like those are going to be your three things. Atelectasis is usually one of your primary causes, if not pneumonia, because pneumonia actually can cause atelectasis, right? Pulmonary edema, especially with your heart failure patients. So if they have in the hospital with heart failure, then odds are it's probably from pulmonary edema. If they're in the hospital with a pneumonia, they probably have both the pneumonia, which is inflammation of their of their respiratory zone, as well as atelectasis, because that inflammation will cause the lung units to collapse. All right, so that's where we usually see that so that shunt-like effect. Um, a high VQ mismatch would be a dead space. Uh, type issues. So this is where you would see that with blood clots, like a diffusion defect, like a right-sided heart failure. Um, those are going to be some of your big ones, right-sided heart failure, clots, um, hypovolemia, right, if their blood pressure is low or if they're bleeding out, things like that would easily cause that. So the A to A would be increased. Non-pulmonary causes of hypoxemia, so this is where the lungs aren't to blame. Uh, reduced blood flow to the tissues, right? Anemia, we'll talk about that. Non-functioning hemoglobin, oh, that's why it's important to get coximetry. Coximetry is going to be your big deal or big important part here to look for non-pulmonary reasons, right? So you need to see if the hemoglobin is or their parking spaces are functioning appropriately. Anatomical shunts or decreased PiO2. They were in an airplane, they lost pressure, right? So on and so forth. Their PiO2 decreased. All right, so reduced blood flow. Um, so would be your heart issue or cardiogenic cause here. So the heart muscle itself is not getting nutrition and oxygen, right? Just think of the heart muscle right now. Now, as a heart muscle, as just a muscle. If you don't give a muscle enough oxygen and nutrients and everything it needs to keep running at a high level that muscle will start to cramp and die after a while right and so that's what you're looking at here with the myocardial infarction right with a heart attack there's 
blood flow not getting to the muscle, to the myocardium, and that heart muscle will then start to die, right? And so that's what you're looking at here. If the heart muscle itself is starting to die, is it going to squeeze very well? And I would, I would say no, right? <laughs> that's where you start to see the blood pressure start to decrease. It, it, it can't squeeze well because the muscle is spasming and dying, right? That's when you're going to see abnormal EKGs. That's when you're going to see their troponins and BMPs, right? All You're going to see all those things start to move. Um, you'll see the abnormal cardiac rhythms, right? What we talked about, heart failure, congestive heart failure is going to be one of your big things here. Um, if you have congestive heart failure, the squeeze, the contraction of the heart is very, very weak, right? Uh, it's like uh, trying to squeeze, you have a dry sponge and a wet sponge, right? If you have a dry sponge in your hand, it's brand new, you take it out of the package, and it's it's not stiff, it's just a, a normal pliable piece of foam sponge you can squeeze it pretty easily but now you take a sponge that's soaked and saturated right and super thick and then let's just say it's saturated with syrup right now you try to squeeze it it's going to be a lot harder to squeeze that so these heart failure patients it whenever their heart muscle squeezes it's like trying to squeeze syrup saturated sponge it's going to be very weak very ineffective it's not going to move very much it's going to have a lot of resistance to the squeeze and so that's what you're looking at here uh, they could also have issues with the valves in the heart as well and or hypovolemia welcome to <laughs> anything that's something that causes their h and h the rbc's to be low could be a gi bleed could be anemia just in general uh, there are a lot of things that can cause hypovolemia besides a trauma. So that's something you just have to look at. So remember, oxygen delivery is dependent upon your cardiac output and how much oxygen is in there, right? I could have a perfect CO2. Remember, CO2 is in volumes percent. So if I have a perfect CO2 of 20 volumes percent, but if I'm not squeezing it, to the rest of my body it's worthless right so i need to have a good cardiac output right the qt is for the squeeze the qt interval of the ekg which would in theory represent the squeeze or systole or the cardiac output right and so that's why the, where the qt comes from that's why i like qt over co co my brain thinks carbon monoxide so QT is your cardiac output, right? So I need to know cardiac output is adequate to deliver that oxygen. If I don't have cardiac output, I don't have the ability to deliver that oxygen. So that's why it's important when you go to these people's rooms and their oxygen levels are low, ask about their vital signs. So you're going to have to look and see, hey, what was their blood pressure, right? Oh, they say the blood pressure is low. Let's say they had a mean arterial pressure, maybe... 54. Well, that's a low mean arterial pressure. So that's when you're going to be thinking, okay, so that's something that could easily cause their oxygen levels to be low. Why is their blood pressure low? Right? Are they septic? What's their temperature? So on and so forth. So this is something that you're going to need to put together down the road and hopefully we'll get more practice on this as well. So anemia can be a very big deal. Any decrease in hemoglobin will decrease the amount of combined oxygen. So that means you cannot carry near as much, right? So the, the remember, you use your hemoglobin concentration, which is part of the anemia thing. Your hemoglobin concentration is part of what carries um, the oxygen, most of the oxygen in your bloodstream. So just changing their hemoglobin levels, right? from 15, uh, 15 uh, to 10 made a big change, 13.2 volumes per cent versus almost perfect 20 volumes per cent. That's a big change. That means we're not caring near as much. So this is why it's important to know uh, if there is anemia. And usually we'll get an H&H, &H, a hemoglobin a hematocrit. Uh, usually those will show up off of blood gas and they can always be run. And off of a CBC, they can also run um, a red blood cell count, and H and H is part of a CBC as well, as well as platelets, which is always good when you're looking at blood gases as well. Of course, we already talked about that. So dysfunctional hemoglobin, hashtag Jerry Springer here. So when you're looking at 
the dysfunctional hemoglobin, that you're looking at something where, okay, I have the ability to get the oxygen into the bloodstream, but it's now not able to park in its parking space because the parking space is all messed up. Someone put something there or it doesn't have the ability to accept a car right now because it's dysfunctional. So abnormal forms of hemoglobin do not carry oxygen in a normal way. So remember we talked about sickle cell, right? HBS. So sickle cell, the sickle cell anemia, it, the sickle cell is does not have near as much surface area as your normal red blood cell, so it's not gonna. It's a dysfunctional hemoglobin. It's not gonna carry as much. Uh, its carrying capacity is diminished. So these are all things like carbon monoxide can easily do this because the parking spaces are uh, attached. Uh, the parking spaces are taken up, right? Someone else had a party and they all decided to park in that parking lot, right? Now you can't park there. Boo. Methemoglobinemia. Uh, we talked about this one. More common, you guys should be more aware because when we nebulize lidocaine and or um, give something like nitric oxide, there's a chance of nitric dioxide. So NO2 uh, is a byproduct if that nitric stays stagnant. NO2, and if the patient gets NO2, they have a high chance of getting uh, methemoglobinemia. So that's something we have to look at. We're the iron inside the hemoglobin instead of being ferrous where it attracts oxygen it becomes ferric where it does not attract oxygen so methemoglobinemia is where it goes from being ferrous to ferric and remember the big treat uh, for methemoglobinemia is going to be methylene blue uh, and that's an IV drug and that's what the they use in the Z Hill Nelson Graham stain test um, so Methemoglobinemia, uh, it won't let it won't be able to attract oxygen to the hemoglobin molecule. It's pretty crazy, and then it, their blood it turns brown, right? And that's actually a board question they'll ask you. They'll say chocolate co colored blood, and that's that methemoglobinemia. It's now ferric, and therefore they need the that methylene blue. Give them a lot of oxygen in the meantime. Um, also, things like cyanide poisoning could easily do this. Uh, cyanide poisoning will inactivate hemoglobin, and it goes from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration pretty quickly here. So cyanide poison can be very severe very fast, and that would be a form of dysfunctional Anatomic shunts, uh, more common in your neonate population. Usually you won't have an adult that tells you they have a tetralogy of flow. Um, but, uh, so if you're working in the kid world, God bless you, I love kids too. Um, so, But this is where you're more likely to see this type of thing and hopefully you'll know about it ahead of time. So congenital shunts can easily cause this as well. Uh, tetralogy of flow is the first one there. Tetralogy of flow, of course, there's four things. There's a VSD, a ventral septal defect. So a hole between the two ventricles. The pulmonary valve is stenotic, which means the opening to the pulmonary artery is very, very narrow, which is not good for blood flow, right? Remember Posey's law. If you narrow something, it increases resistance, right? There's that whole 16-fold thing and all that business. So when you narrow the pulmonary, the opening of the pulmonary artery, you're not going to be able to get a lot of blood into the lungs, which means are you going to be able to get a lot of oxygen into the bloodstream if there's no, hardly any blood going to the lungs to begin with, right? So that's not going to be good. The other two parts of that, the aorta <laughs> is actually going to be in between the right and left ventricle as well. So it's getting blood from both the right side of the heart as well as the left side of the heart. And then, not only that, the right side of the heart becomes thicker, right? So then you have hypertrophy of the right side of the heart. The right myocardium gets thicker and stronger. So tetralogy is four different things. It's a VSD, a stenotic pulmonary valve, an aortic that's, they call it overriding. It's an aortic that's in between the right and left ventricles. So it's called an overriding aorta as well as a uh, hypertrophy of the right side of the heart. So it's pretty significant. That's something that 
will try to treat early on. They could also have a pulmonary arterial venous um, fistula as well. Uh, these are abnormal blood vessels that can occur in the lungs, and it's just genetic. It just can easily happen. A pulmonary AV fistula, um, one of you could easily have it, I could easily have it, and just not know it, and just not be very significant. So that's something that easily can happen. Remember, the body will compensate for hypoxemia by increasing the respiratory rate, the heart rate, and or the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin would be for chronic hypoxemia, which is what you see with uh, people that have emphysema and COPD. Uh, they'll be polycythemic, right, to create more hemoglobin. So they're trying to compensate or cheat the system by creating more parking spaces. That way they can carry more oxygen and do less work. So they'll be tachypnic, tachycardic, and have a higher hemoglobin. So red blood cell too, right, polycythemia. Acceptable levels for PO2s on sea level. Notice this says sea level because your board exam will be taken on patients that are theoretically at sea level. All right, Just breathing room air. So these are normal levels. You do need to know these normals. You guys can all read, so I don't actually need to um, read these to you. Thank goodness. <laughs> but you do need to know these normal levels. Um, notice the neonate here, I want to take a point here, is uh, 40 to 70. And so that's something because they have um, fetal hemoglobin. Remember they have the HBF. I cannot draw anything on here. Um, that fetal hemoglobin. <laughs> oh, heavens. That fetal hemoglobin is left shifted automatically, so they can run a normal. Um, a no, uh, they can they can be normal in that um, PO2 of 40 to 70, and because they're left shifted, because they have fetal hemoglobin until they're about six months of age, uh, they won't be hypoxic uh, as far as their tissues go. Right? They'll have still good oxygen delivery to their brain, to the heart, to their kidneys, and so on because their fetal hemoglobin sort of keeps them there. So we're okay if you go up to the NICU and you see a newborn's PO2 of 45 or 50, that's okay, right? That's that's normal, that's fine for them because they're purposely left shifted, but they're still gonna be able to have good oxygen delivery to their tissues too. So it's pretty cool stuff there. They can survive on a little bit lower levels. As you age, of course, your PO2s uh, will also decrease. Everything goes downhill as you age. There you go. Uh, this is to do with your loss of surface area because of disgrammatization of the respiratory zone, right? We talked about that in pulmonary AMP, which I'm sure you all remember. Uh, I didn't even need to say the disgrammatization of the respiratory zone as you get older because you all remembered it right off the top of your head. Uh, so when you're looking at this, uh, uh, this is where we predicted an 8 gradient where you take their age divided by 4 plus 4, right? That's exactly what this is sort of looking at here. As you get older, your PO2 is where it gets harder and harder to get oxygen to your bloodstream because your surface area over time is just naturally destroyed. And that's okay. But it's just something to be aware of when we're taking care of more generationally advanced All right, PO2 saturation levels, right? Uh, you should know these normal ranges, mild, moderate, severe. I will make you guys, I will, right? You heard that. I will make you guys do interpretations again with mild, moderate, severe. What is this? It's an acute respiratory acidosis with mild hypoxemia, right? So expect to do that again. The more practice, the better. That. Relationships, sort of that normal relationship when you're looking at these things. Um, all this is meant to look at uh, just if someone's on 40% or 0.4 FiO2, remember FiO2 is fraction. So 0.4 FiO2 and 40%, same thing, just one's a concentration and one is a fractional index. So you're looking at the normal relationship 
to a human. So in this one, what do you notice? As you get to a higher oxygen concentration, or as you get to a higher FiO2, what happens? Right? Yeah, that PaO2 changes. So you're seeing a big difference here. And one of the things that we could do to look at this is we could take um, their FiO2, and we can say, okay, if I take their FiO2 times their barometric pressure, right, then I can subtract whatever their CO2 level is, and uh, from 10, and I can sort of see what their normal or what their PaO2 is, P big AO2, so their alveolar air. So let's do an example. All right. So I have a person on 30% oxygen or 0.3, right? And they're at sea level. So what's 3 times 7? All right. So when you're looking at this, I'm just going to add a zero to what I just did. So whatever 3 times 7 is, I'm not going to say it out loud. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, just add a zero. Um, and then let's say their CO2 was uh, 40. So then I'm just going to add 10 to this, this, the CO2. So then I'll have a total of 50, right? So then I will subtract whatever I got over here. Whatever this number was over here, I'm going to subtract it from 50 right because I added 10 to the CO2 um, and then I can actually see what their normal is I'm not gonna expect you guys it's a shortcut and I'm not gonna expect you guys to know that shortcut we'll revisit it when it comes time for the board exams just remind me to tell you the cheats for all the equations when it comes time to so the board exams right now that those cheats can confuse a lot of people and I don't like teaching them unless you're about ready to take the boards and usually knowing that there is a cheat just is reassuring enough to get you to calm down for the board so that'll be good all right <laughs> evaluation for hypoxemia on room air patient um, so we have a patient here uh, so there's something called the 70 70 rule uh, at 10 SPO2 equals 100, so subtract 5 from each. Uh, then you should sort of see how bad their hypoxemia level is. So mild will be less than 80, moderate less than 60, and severe less than 40. So there's a way to sort of look at this. Um, when they're older, when they're younger, there's a way to sort of do this. This is why I just like the 8 to 8 gradient um, divided by 4 plus 4 to sort of see what their normal is and then compare their 8 to 8 gradient to what's normal for their age. That way you don't have to worry about this math that I'm trying to say here. All right. So evaluation of hypoxemia and oxygen therapy. So remember, they're uncorrected, corrected, or overcorrected, right? If they're uncorrected, that means their PO2 is less than 60 and they're on oxygen. Right? If I say the patient's on 0.35 on FiO2, so you'd say they're on oxygen. So instead of using the mild, moderate, moderate severe category, you're going to use the uncorrected, corrected, overcorrected categories, right? And that's what this is showing. So if they're on oxygen, you're going to use the uncorrected, corrected, overcorrected category. If they're on room air, so that's 21, then you're going to use the mild, moderate, severe, or normal levels. Now, um, this doesn't change. These are the same levels you learned when we were in class in pulmonary MP. Um, always good times. You can always go reintroduce yourself to Disjardins. <laughs> uh, if you need some time with Disjardins again, which I know you all want to. Henderson Hasselbach, I will not make you calculate this. This is 6.1 plus the log of bicarb over carbonic acid, which is CO2 times 0 0.03. Not 0 0.03, 0 0.03. Uh, this is a good estimation of pH, so if you get a patient and you think their SANS electrode, which is the pH electrode, is malfunctioning on your equipment, you can easily do the good old 
Henderson Hasselbach or HH equation, and that should help you figure out if their pH truly is roughly correct or if their pH electrode needs to be uh, recalibrated and rerun the gas. All right, blood gas. Oh, heavens. You better know the normal blood gas values, all right? pH um, 74, uh, so 735 to 745. Mix Venus 7.33 to 7.43. So you better know those. Uh, PO2 80 to 100 in arterial and in Venus 35 to 40 millimeters of mercury. So PO2 in arterial 80 to 100. Venus 35 to 40. Saturation 95% or greater, right? In arterial, saturation mixed venous 70 to 75% is what I want you to know. Uh, in venous, so 70 75% in venous. For PCO2, 35 to 45, of course, in arterial, and then 41 to 51 in venous millimeters of mercury. And then bicarb in arterial, 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. In venous, 24 to 28 milliequivalents per liter. And base excess is negative 2 to plus 2 in arterial. And mixed venous base excess is 0 to plus 4. So you do need to know those values. Hopefully you got those down. You can always play it back again slowly too. So definitions. An acid is a substance that can donate hydrogen ions so it gives away hydrogen ions how generous of you right it donates the hydrogen icons so here you see carbonic acid oh i love a good carbonic acid equation right and it's being uh, broken up into hydrogen ions and bicarb and so it's donating a hydrogen therefore it is an acid a base is a substance that accepts the hydrogen ions. They're very accepting those bases. All bases are alkaline and they accept it. So here you see bicarb uh, seeing a free roaming hydrogen ion that was lonely. And so it's like, hey, I see you over there. You know, uh, let's accept you into our group. And then they become uh, H2CO3, which is carbonic acid again. Um, so this is where we're looking at a base, a bicarb being the base, accepting an acid. So those good old people there, one donates, the other one accepts, it's just a happy time. Acid-based terms. Uh, so pH is uh, a measurement. Uh, it's the only way to tell... Uh, to tell if the body is in normal homeostasis. And so an acidemia would be an acid condition of the blood, less than 7.35 arterial. An acidosis is the process of causing acidemia. Alkalemia is an alkaline, uh, sorry, an alkaline condition of the blood. So greater than 7.45. And alkalosis is the process of causing alkalemia. So you see the process of causing is an acidosis. The process of causing alkalemia, right? So the process of causing is the osis, <laughs> the abnormal condition, right? The process of causing is the osis. The emia part is the condition of the blood. So one's the, one's the condition. All right, so respiratory parameters. The PCO2 is the pressure or tension, right? Millimeters of mercury of dissolved CO2 in the blood. So this uh, respiratory causes. Uh, so you're looking at normal CO2 equals normal ventilation. High CO2 means hypoventilation. Low CO2 means hypo ventilation, right? Low CO2 means you've seen a ghost. You hyperventilated. High CO2 means uh, the you you passed out from seeing the ghost and now you're hypo. But like, I don't know. Um, causes a respiratory acidosis uh, where you retain CO2. Obstructive lung disease is going to be probably one of the primary ones you guys will be seeing in your careers if you're working with adults. 
uh, obstructive lung disease. Uh, remember, it's either destruction or some other manner that's obstructing gas flowing into and out, out of their lung tissue. So that's going to obstruct CO2 from being eliminated as well. Whether or not it's destroying tissue, their ability to move gas is decreased. Uh, over sedation. <laughs> yeah, welcome to a lot of stuff out there. Over sedation can easily uh, cause this. Uh, this is um, something that uh, is more common with opiate uh, abusers and things like that. Um, even with normal lungs, they could still have an issue where they'll retain CO2 because their brain is just does not have the ability to send its signals because it's being uh, over sedated. The brain stem itself is actually being impeded from firing those signals. Uh, neuromuscular, we already talked about this one. Uh, Guillain-Barre, myasthenia gravis, SMA, ALS, like all these things that are out there can easily decrease the drive to breathe, and that's why some of these patients will be vent dependent and or uh, need some assistance with a diaphragmatic pacer. Uh, hypoventilation with mechanical ventilation. This means, well, we're not giving them enough minute ventilation with our machine, and therefore we have to increase. So this could actually happen where we actually set a normal minute ventilation on a ventilator. If we set a normal tidal volume, we set a normal rate, and then what happens? Well, the patient gets worse, and so the requirements for minute ventilation increase. So that means now we draw blood gas on that patient, and it's no longer enough. The settings we had in there are no longer enough for that patient. So now we're going to have to increase our rate or increase our tidal volume. AKA, we're, we're going to have to increase their minute ventilation in some way to adjust for their new changes in their life function. So that's something that we have to look at here. Are they hypoventilating because they, they either got worse or we don't have the right settings in place, right? Uh, they could have a OHS, obesity-induced hypoventilation syndrome. So it's called OHS. Obesity-induced hypoventilation system syndrome. Uh, it used to be known as Pickwickian syndrome, and we'll talk about this more in disease class. Uh, but in the papers of Pickwick, and I think it's Charles Dickens that wrote it, a uh, large man uh, that was, was very sleepy all the time, snored very loudly. Uh, he had that obesity-induced hypoventilation syndrome, and that's the papers of Pickwick. That was like a classic thing it out. Uh, causes of respiratory alkalosis, of course hypoxemia, because if you're hypoxic, get rid of CO2, right? Your brain stem saying, hey, if I get rid of CO2, whatever CO2 I have, then I'll have more room for oxygen to get onto my hemoglobin. And I can carry way more oxygen on my hemoglobin than I can on my plasma. So I'm going to tell my lungs to hyperventilate. And when I do this, I'll resolve my hypoxemia. So that's what you're looking at here. So a person could be in alkalosis because they're actually hypoxemic. Their body's trying to compens compensate. And that's what you're seeing here. So uh, nervousness, anxiety, of course, uh, <laughs> you can easily see a ghost. Uh, about to give a lecture. Uh, pulmonary embolism can easily cause this as well. Pulmonary embolism causes hypoxemia because there's less blood flow going to the lungs because there's blood clot, right? There's a blood clot that's blocking blood from flowing into the lungs. So you're going to see uh, hypoxemia, which then causes that respiratory al alkalosis. Pulmonary fibrosis, of course, uh, pulmonary fibrosis is going to be one of your big ones that causes a respiratory alkalosis initially because uh, you have that lung tissue that's sort of turning into um, scar tissue. And you're going to have the lungs start to be like, well, I'm going to have to increase my rate because I can't expand as much. So I'm going to increase my rate. So by increasing the rate, they're actually going to blow off CO2. Because there's such a diffusion defect as well, right? Remember that 
AC membranes get thicker with a pulmonary fibrosis, that's going to be a big cause of them breathing faster, which is then going to get rid of more CO2 initially, so their pulmonary fibrosis gets worse, unfortunately. Uh, hyperventilation with mechanical ventilation. This is more common on patients that are discharged on mechanical ventilation. So someone comes into the hospital, they are now a long-term mechanical ventilation patient. Let's say they're responding to cord injury, uh, for an example. Um, we send them home, and let's say they developed a pneumonia while they were in the hospital, right? We send them home, and then they progressively still recover from their pneumonia. And now the settings that we had on them that they were fine with initially at the hospital are now more extreme than what they need on a healthy baseline. So now they're in an alkalosis, right? They're, we hyperventilating for now the healthy state that they are. And that can happen from time to time. Uh, brain damage, I've seen this happen with neural, uh, uh, neural injuries, especially uh, where they hyperventilate as a response to a neural injury, and their pHs are high, they're in the 7.5s, and we're debating how soon we can get a trach or something to stop the mechanical ventilation from assisting them in their hyperventilation. Uh, silicates, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth in disease class, but uh, silicates are an acid and the body's trying to compensate for this acid by breathing faster. So you have a metabolic acidosis, so the body's trying to compensate by breathing faster. And so that's something that you'll see as well. Uh, fever, more cowbell, couldn't resist. Uh, fever, uh, if you have respiratory alkalosis, of course you're going to breathe faster. Your CO2 is going to decrease because you have a higher metabolic rate. Uh, your body also helps regulate its own temperature by breathing faster. You'll see that on neonates. If the baby gets really tachypnic, one of the first things we check are their vital signs. And if their temperature's high, that's probably the cause, right? Their body's trying to regulate its temperature by breathing faster. Heart failure, uh, we already talked about this one. The lung tissue no longer has the ability to stretch because it has edema. Um, and so the ability for it to stretch and move is very diminished. And so uh, you're going to try to breathe faster because you can't breathe deep. So you're going to try to breathe faster. And as a result of breathing faster, of course, your CO2 level will go down. Uh, asthma. Asthma. In the early stages, so in the mild stages, you'll have a respiratory alkalosis. Uh, moderate stages, you'll have a normal blood gas. In the severe stages, you'll have a respiratory acidosis. Um, so that's something that you'll see three stages with asthma. The initial mild stage will be an alkalosis. Severe anemia, of course, you'll have a respiratory alkalosis because since the blood cannot carry as much, doesn't have as much carrying capacity, if I get rid of more CO2, then whatever capacity I have can be increased by getting rid of CO2 and therefore I can carry more oxygen, right? So it's all about Parkinson's face. All right, non-causes or metabolic acidosis. So bicarb and base excess are influenced only by non-respiratory processes. These are a metabolic process. So this should be metabolic, right? Type metabolic in there. Uh, anything other than respiratory causes that would affect the acid-base balance is sort of what goes on here. So base excess, base deficit, let me talk about that real quick. Uh, this is how much base there is in the blood and how much acid you'd have to add to get it back to normal, right? So that's where you look at base excess versus base deficit. So how much base is there in the blood, right? And how much you would have to add to get it back to normal. I hope that makes sense. So if I had a base deficit of negative two. So normal is negative two to plus two, right? That's a normal value there, a normal variation. So if I had a negative two, and this is how much acid or how much base is in the blood and how much acid I would have to add to get it back to normal. So if I had a negative two, that means I have more acid than base, and I would have to add more base to get it back to normal. Let's say I had a plus two. That means I would have to add uh, more to more acid to get that back to normal. 
So base excess base, base deficit tells you how much base is in the blood and how much acid you would have to add or subtract or whatever to get it back to normal. So how balance that relationship? So metabolic abnormalities, things that will increase uh, non-volatile acid, bicarb, or decreased would be non-volatile acid using up bicarb or you're, you're losing bicarb with excessive urination, things like that. And I think I put causes. Yeah. So non-causes. So fluid losses in the upper GI tract. So this would be lots of vomiting, right? Fluid losses from the upper GI tract. Loss of fluid that does not contain bicarb. So remember, you have mostly stomach acid. So if I'm vomiting, I would cause a metabolic alkalosis, right? Because I'm getting rid of an acid. Therefore, it would be a metabolic al alkalosis. Uh, rapid correction of chronic hypercapnia. So let's say I, uh, you have a patient in the emergency department and they overdose on a drug um, and they're starting to come around on their own um, and they were in a respiratory acidosis. They were hypercapnic, aka hypercarbic, same thing. So they were hypercapnic and then their body's like <sighs> trying to hyperventilate to come back out of that, right? Because they were hypoventilating for such a long time and now their body's trying to correct for it by hyperventilating. So that would cause a respiratory, or sorry, a non respiratory or a metabolic alkalosis. Diuretics can easily do this. So Lasix is the most common one that you'll see out there, furosemide. This is a loop diuretic. Um, thiazides can also do that as well. These are all diuretics, and the loss of hydrogen ions is what you're looking at here. All diuretics work off of getting rid of salt, which you know water always follows salt. So when you're doing the diuretics, so Lasix is going to be one of the big ones, the more potent ones, they're also going to lose hydrogen ions. So that could actually make them into more of an alkalosis. So if a person's in an alkalotic state, giving them a high dose of diuretics may actually cause them to actually get more alkalotic. So that's something you have to be very cognizant of. And your body cannot handle bases as much as it can handle acids. So if you want to err, err on the side of a more of an acidosis than an alkalosis. Uh, treatment of corticosteroids, so if we give the person prednisone, uh, cortisone, anything like that, any of the zones, uh, this will increase the chances of hyperaldosteronism. Uh, and this means uh, it'll stimulate the secretions of potassium and hydrogen and the reabsorption of bicarb. And so this will change their way that they exchange their electrolytes and therefore make them into more of the ability to go into respiratory alkalosis overall. Uh, increased uh, in unspecified anions. So this is where we're looking at gap versus non-gap. I love talking about gap versus non-gap and something that you'll talk about again in fifth semester as well. Uh, this separates you from the rest of a lot of people in the hospital when you know gap versus non-gap stuff. So often to refer to as an anion gap. So we look at this with renal failure or acids. Uh, increased in phosphate, creatine, sulfates. We talked about sulfates just a little bit ago. An increased in negatively charged acids. So lactic acid from a metabolic acidosis or ketoacidosis like a diabetic ketoacidosis. So these are all things that can cause a metabolic acidosis. So when you see a metabolic acidosis, when you see a metabolic alkalosis, right, we need to not just say, hey, it's not a respiratory problem. It's I'm going to walk away. We need to be still a part of that team. Hey, this patient's still very sick. How can we help them get better, right? So that's something that we're going to have to look at further on. We just can't walk away from these patients. All right, so what's a gap, an ion gap? So this is the negatively charged ions, right, and the positively charged. So I'm going to take their sodium and potassium minus their bicarbon chloride. So remember, bicarb is negatively charged, chloride is negatively charged, sodium is a cation, positive charge, and there's some of them that also put potassium here, right? 
whether or not it's there, it's not a big deal. Um, so you're going to take your cations minus your anions, and you're going to see what the difference is. And when you're doing this, a uh, normal gap is roughly around 11, right? Uh, or so if you're putting in normal values here, right? That's all we did here is just put in normal values. So if the anion gap is greater than 15, it's considered a gap acidosis. If the gap is less than 15, so let's say we draw blood gas and we see that their pH is 7.10. Right, that's a severe acidosis. And let's say their CO2 is 19. So their CO2 is low, pH is low. So this is a metabolic acidosis of some sort. Now we need to figure out what's causing the metabolic acidosis. Is it a gap acidosis or non-gap acidosis? So we're going to look at there ions, right? We're going to look at this. If the gap is greater than 15, then we know it's a gap acidosis. That means usually it's the addition of an acid, like a lactic acidosis, right? If it's less than 15, then it's a non-gap. So it could be the loss of a base. So let's say they have a massive amount of diarrhea. Loss of a base, right? So that's usually what we're looking at here. What had been their symptoms? What's going on with this patient? can we be a better part of their care team, All right? So causes of a metabolic acidosis, an increase in anions, right? DKA, starvation, all right, ketoacidosis, alcohol, ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, renal failure, poisonings. Notice all these are the addition of some sort of acid to the system or the system creating an acid. So if there's a high difference in your anions, it's the addition of an acid, right? So if there's a gap acidosis, it's the addition of an acid. Um, so you're seeing this with gap versus non-gap, right? So this would be non-gap, so less than 15, and this would be, oh, I'm trying to write the word gap over here. <laughs> it's not gonna work, but um, so non-gap would be on your right the gap would be on your left. So with the gap acidosis, right, everything is the addition of an acid. You're adding acid somehow to the body. With a non-gap, you're losing a base. So that's why I talked about diarrhea or jaundice or, um, so, or treatment with a drug called Diamox. And Diamox here, I believe, is potassium sparing diuretic. I'll have to look that up. Um, and that would uh, help treat a acidosis. So if I had a metabolic acidosis, whether it was gap or non-gap, and I'm trying to fix or correct that gap, uh, or fix or correct that acidosis, we could actually give them a drug called Diamox, and that would actually help bring them pH back to a normal level. So let's say we have a patient, again, that 7.19 patient, and so that patient, we cannot figure out a way to get them uh, out of it. And so one of the things we could do, um, or sorry, a 7.50 patient, <laughs> my bad, 7.50, that looks like two. All right, heavens to Betsy. All right, so we have a patient that has a 7.50 pH. Uh, very, very alkalotic, very, very dangerous, high risk for um, going into bad things. So when we're looking at that, we could easily give them Diamox, and that would actually help them be become more acidotic to a normal acid-based balance. Um, in there, uh, antifreeze, um, solvents, fuels, any of those like foreign things, those toxins, they're more likely to cause a gap acidosis, right? So anything that's like a toxin or something to get into, that's when you're usually looking at a gap acidosis. Um, so this is just a mnemonic that's out there of causes of high anion gap acidosis. I don't expect you to know this, but I put it in here for your enjoyment. Same thing here, I don't expect you to know this or memorize it. However, I put it in here for your enjoyment. So normals for gaps 
in non-gaps um, causes, and which we've already gone over it a little bit. All right, our two or both guesses, the body tries to compensate versus correcting. So compensation is defined as the alternate component not primarily affected what the body does ultimately. So the correction is going to be altering the component primarily involved. So what do we want to treat? All right, what do we what do we do? What do we what's the treatment? So how is the body compensating? Well, it alters the component that's not primarily affected. So if my CO2 level is high, it's going to alter my bicarb level, right? That's compensation. Correction is saying, hey, my CO2 level is high. I'm going to start to breathe faster to get rid of it. So if I have a pulmonary problem, I'm going to use a pulmonary fix. Right, so correction is using a pulmonary, seeing a pulmonary problem, and using a pulmonary fix. Compensation is seeing a pulmonary problem and using a metabolic fix, or vice versa. Right, so compensation means we're going to increase the other side of that chemical equation to help balance it. Correction means we're going to stop that first part from increasing in the first place, so we don't have to balance the other guy out. So you do need to know the difference between compensation and correction. The body will compensate by trying to return to a, ratio, a normal ratio by carb to carbonic acid. Um, back to that 20 to 1 in the plasma. The respiratory problems are metabolically compensated, usually within that first 48 hours or so. Metabolic uh, problems are respiratory compensated in what could be minutes to hours depending on what's going on. So when you're looking at compensation, respiratory acidosis will try to compensate with the kidneys trying to retain bicarb. With respiratory alkalosis, the kidneys will try to excrete bicarb. With a metabolic acidosis, you're going to hyperventilate. With a metabolic alkalosis, you'll try to hypoventilate. It'll decrease your drive to breathe. So you see how compensation is using a different force. It's using the opposite force. It's using the yin and the yang. It's using the opposite thing to sort it out. So when you're looking at correcting, you, if you have a metabolic acid alkalosis, you're going to treat the cause. So let's say someone is um, vomiting or anything like that, or diuretics or anything like that. Um, that's something that we can we would try to treat it directly. Uh, like diet mox will cause the excretion of bicarb. So if someone is severely alkalotic. Instead of us retaining CO2, we're going to give them diamox, right, to help get them from that 750 down. So if they're off, instead of using the opposite component and stressing the body more, we're just going to focus on the sick component to begin with. So let's say they're on a ventilator, right, and they're in a metabolic alkalosis. Well, instead of their bicarb being excreted, why don't we just decrease their tidal volume or decrease the frequency of breathing? Or maybe we just add dead space to the circuit where they're rebreathing more of their own CO2. So that way we're correcting the problem instead of making their body compensate for it. Because if they're sick, making their body compensate for it may be a very bad move overall. So correcting, correcting means you're treating the cause. Um, sodium bicarb, what you see there, um, can be used. You're going to take their, it's something that's controversial out there, and we'll have to talk about it more. But ultimately, when you give sodium bicarb, you can actually cause a metabolic acidosis to actually get worse. So you only give it in cir certain circumstances, but we'll talk about it here. Uh, as if you are giving it in every circumstance, unfortunately. This is where you take their body weight and at times the bicarb deficiency. So let's say that they're a um, negative 4 or negative 10 on their base deficit, right? Um, 
then you're going to do it um, times 0.3, which equals how much bicarb you would then give this patient. So body weight times bicarb deficiency times 0.3, and that will give you how much bicarb you should give the patient. So on the ventilator, if I had a metabolic acidosis, I can help correct it um, by increasing tidal volume or rate or inhalation ultimately. So with the respiratory alkalosis, we want to treat the cause if we can. Uh, oxygen for hypoxemia, of course, calm the patient down if they're breathing fast and anxious. CO2 therapy, that's that old classic breathe into a paper bag thing. But uh, if they're on the ventilator, we're not going to put a paper bag over them. We're going to just decrease the tidal volume or the rate, or we can actually add more dead space or more circuit to the ventilator, and that will allow them to rebreathe more of their CO2, just like they're breathing. A little bit of a paper bag. Uh, respiratory acidosis, obviously we want to treat the cause with correction. Um, bronchial hygiene, especially if their airway is full of thick, sticky mucus, uh, airway clearance therapy of some sort is going to really be a big benefit to them. If they're on the ventilator, then we're going to try to increase the tidal volume or the